In our last unit, I said that managers have to provide motivators for our employees. Well, it sounds good, but it's very hard to do. One of the reasons that it's so hard to find out what is going to motivate individuals is that individuals don't see the world the same way. Needs, unsatisfied needs, distort reality. We're, it's like, kind of like mirrors in an amusement park. We all lug around our own personal mirror. Who we are, what we do, all affect this perceptual distortion. For example, one of my favorite stories is about a Texan. A Texan who's driving through Maine last summer. As soon as I said Texan, I bet I didn't have to tell you that that Texan is wearing a 10-gallon hat and driving a Cadillac and smoking a big cigar because Texans are supposed to. You see, most of us carry a hardened perception about Texans in stories. Well, this Texan pays his toll at Augusta, up in the great state of Maine, and he gets a little bit lost, and it's a very hot day, and his car starts to overheat, plus he's lost. He goes down a dirt road, and at the end of the dirt road, he finds an old, dilapidated Maine farmhouse. And on the front porch is an old, dilapidated Maine farmer. Now, as soon as I told you Maine farmer, I'm sure I didn't have to tell you that that Maine farmer wears things like built well overalls. He wears L.L. Bean boots, and he smokes a corncob pipe, and he says things like, you can't get there from here. The Texan goes up to the farmer and says, excuse me, partner, but my throat's on fire, my car's overheated, can I please have some water? Farmer says, sure, son, and pumps him up a bucket of water, he gives the bucket to the Texan, Texan gives his horse and himself a big drink, returns the bucket. When he returns the bucket, he says to the farmer, tell me, partner, how much land do you have here on your spread? Well, the people in Maine are very proud of those farms, and this farmer's no exception. He got up and he said, from here to the road, 60 feet. But back there, to that stand of pine, I've got six, 700 feet and it's all mine. The Texan smiled and he said, you know, back home in West Texas, I get into that car at six o'clock in the morning, I pack a lunch, and I drive and I drive and I drive and I drive until six o'clock at night. When I come to the end of my land, there was a long silence and the farmer put his hand up on the Texan's shoulder and said, son, I had a car like that once myself. What those two people were saying to each other, what they heard was distorted because of who they are, where they came from, what their backgrounds were. A very similar thing happens when you and I go to work because we put on a role, a mantle of management. Everybody does that, whether we're going to work or not. A basic concept called the Johari Window has been around in psychology for a long time. What the Johari Window says, in a very simple way, is that most of us play complex roles in life. We have a conscious self, an unconscious self, roles that we play when we go to work and we act as parents and whatever. And then there's the role that others see. Actually, Hausman said it better. Hausman said in a poem once that three men went down the road as down the road went he. The man he was, the man they saw, the man he wanted to be. Not only is what we are distorting reality all the time, what we do also distorts reality. For example, Everyone watching this has probably been in a hospital, and in most hospitals, way down in the bowels of the organization, there's a unit called the intensive care unit. Down there in the intensive care unit, people are the most sick. Down there, you've got some of your most professionally trained staff. One nurse, for example, is listening to beeps and monitors, and her span of control, her total concern, is probably one patient. Everything looks good today, Mr. Kugel. Thank you, nurse. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, Karen. Yes, Mrs. Vasello. The trash container in the corner is full of disposables, and there is something dripping down the side. Would you get it cleaned up as soon as you can, please? Sure, Mrs. Vasello. Here I am worried about, about this guy going into cardiac, cardiac arrest, and she's worried about wastebaskets. Nancy, do you realize there are three light bulbs out in this corridor and the Board of Trustees are taking a tour this afternoon? I want you to get it fixed right away. Please see to it. Yes, Mr. McCarthy. Here I am trying to keep the patients out of garbage and he's worried about light bulbs. The point is, the lights are out. There is garbage in the corner. The patients do have to be cared for. Everybody involved has a different view of this organization. Management has a bird's eye view. It flies in at 15,000 feet and looks down. Everybody else has a worm's eye view and looks up. 
But what happens to us in organizational life when we spin at different speeds, when we have different views and different uniforms and different tasks? What happens is human beings stereotype. Stereotyping is something that goes beyond psychology to instinct. We want to identify with people who are like ourselves. In a classic study, somebody brought a group of people into a room and gave them party hats. Some of the hats were red and some of the hats were green. No instructions. After a while, people were milling around, so somebody put on his party hat, so they all put on their party hats. After a little while longer, all the people with red hats went to one side of the room and all the people with green hats went to the other side of the room. They then pulled people out one at a time and interviewed them. So they'd sit down, some person with a red hat, and say, tell me, sir or madam, what do you think is going on inside that room? And the person with the red hat would say, I don't know, but I don't like what those SOBs and green hats are planning. That's stereotyping. So not only do you have the problem of people stereotyping, not only do you have distortions in perception based on what people are and where they come from, what they do, as a manager, you got another problem. Your other problem is that people tend to rationalize when they fail. People tend to say, but, 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 when things go wrong. See, we have our own personal bestest self-image of ourselves. It goes back to Maslow. And we want to protect that. Well, what happens when things go wrong? How can we get managers and supervisors and, em and employees to recognize their mistakes and learn from them? They have to overcome the problem of cognitive dissonance reduction. Cognitive dissonance reduction. What happens when we're locked between a couple of cognitions and they don't fit? The cognition's a bit of knowledge. For example, how many of you out there smoke? I have a pack of cigarettes here, as some of you do. And on my pack of cigarettes, it says, warning, the Surgeon General has determined that cigarette smoking is dangerous to your health. Now, it's very small and you probably didn't see that. Naturally, you'll probably give up cigarette smoking right away. Or will you? What will you do if you're a cigarette smoker and you're locked between two cognitions? One cognition is, I can't stop. The other cognition is, the Surgeon General says, it's not good for me. What most rational, intelligent, healthy human beings do is to attack the cognition they can do something about. Like, who says it's not good for me? And so we rationalize. Now, the non-smokers are standing back looking at this dialogue and looking and thinking about insanity. Why? Because if you don't smoke, do you agree that it's kind of insane to grow a weed in the ground, to wash it off, you hope they wash it off, chop it up, wrap it up in paper, set it on fire and ingest the waste material into your body? And yet your colleagues, your friends, the people in this very room are doing that every day, many times a day, and they're rationalizing. They're saying, but, 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 but. I wonder, for example, if you saw the very famous anti-smoking ad, William Tallman, used to be burger in Perry Mason. He never won a case. Towards the end of his life, he was dying of cancer, and he filmed an anti-smoking ad that was shocking. Here was a familiar face to most Americans of that generation. We knew who he was, and he looked terrible, and he looked you right in the eye, and he said, I smoked three packs a day for 15 years, and now I am dying. He said, I beg you, don't make the mistake that I made. Please stop smoking. The screen went blank and the announcer said, Mr. Tallman died two weeks later. Wow. After that ad, sales of cigarettes in the United States skyrocketed. People who smoked looked at that ad and said, good Lord, I never saw anything like that in my life. We thrust people into cognitive dissonance reduction. We drove them to their drugstores to buy more cigarettes. The greater the, the discomfort, the greater the rationalization. And after that ad, there were a lot of people who had a lot of discomfort. It happens at work. It happens every day. For example, I remember once driving a baby carriage up to a supermarket. My child was in that baby carriage, six months old, and I was a very proud father. I wanted my child to have a dog because I never had a dog. I went to the library, took out a book on golden retrievers, because I decided after doing research that golden retrievers were the way to go. Put the book on the kid's lap, waited outside the supermarket while my wife went to do some shopping, and two little old ladies walked by. They walked by, looked in the carriage, and one of them turned to me and said, oh, I see you have a golden retriever. She didn't even look at the kid. She focused in on that book, and she proceeded to tell me a story how they, she and her sister, also had a dog, an Irish terrier, seven years old, and it died the day before. She was obviously very upset. She wanted to talk about it, so I listened. And she proceeded to tell me how they went to a famous restaurant 
hot August day, locked the dog in the car in this open parking lot in the middle of the day, and went in to have lunch. Two hours later, they came back, gave the dog some water, then they took a tour of the local amusement park, and at the end of the afternoon, came back and found the dog dead in the back seat. She looked me right in the eye and she said, isn't it too bad that Irish Terriers have weak hearts? Now, I had just done research. I was just at the library. Irish Terriers don't have weak hearts. They're yappy little dogs. They live to be 14 years old. They guard the house. They mix martinis. They do lots of stuff except drop dead at seven years of age. Now, if you understand the dynamics of cognitive distance reduction, if you, can, if you know that that poor woman is trying to rationalize what happened, you're in charge. You're not going to let some little 90-pound old lady jerk you around the parking lot of your local supermarket. You can decide what you want to say. You could say, for example, no, lady, realizing that she's in cognitive dissonance and distorting reality, no, lady, you killed that dog. Or, if you have no guts at all, you could say, isn't it too bad that Irish Terriers have weak hearts? You know what I said. I wonder how many dogs she's killed since. The process of rationalization goes on all the time between employee and manager. When things don't go right, what you want to do is establish a relationship with the people who work for you so that you can get the straight information. So that they aren't constantly running their motor and making excuses. They can learn from their mistakes and get on with it. You know, you don't want to be like a hostess who invites someone to her apartment in a, in a story I heard recently. On the 22nd floor, she invited someone to dinner. The guest arrived, she handed him a drink, walked into the kitchen to finish making dinner. Meanwhile, the guest was out in the living room playing with a woman's German Shepherd. And they had a little rubber bone, and the, the guest kept throwing the bone around the apartment. The German Shepherd rushed over and grabbed it and brought it back. They were both having a very good time when the guest inadvertently threw the bone harder than he intended. It bounced right over the balcony and fell 22 stories. And the German Shepherd bounced right after it. The guest was stunned. He didn't know what to say. Shortly thereafter, they were sitting down to dinner, and he turned to his hostess and he said, Martha, it may be my imagination, but your dog seemed very depressed tonight. In order to get the straight information, you and I have got to manage our people in a way that helps eliminate that kind of distortion. Let's take a look now at your perceptions, your attitudes, and the kinds of things that may be affecting your distortion of reality.